Did you do that one? I did the original set because I already had all the setups and the drawings done by the time we put it. I did send you and send you. Good, really good, good excuse, good excuse yeah. for this first week after that. Oh, well, yeah, I know that. Everybody? Okay. Well, the, the, the one Jake's asking about is uh, kind of looks like a, a nuclear power plant cooling tower. And uh, yeah, considered to be solid, so that uh, this is one of those cases where the actual weight of it itself is what it needs to support. So at uh, any particular place, well, you need to find out the stress at the bottom. Determine the radial dimensions are as a function of z. So the average normal stress and the pedestal remains constant. Oh, okay. So you have uh, R here as a function of Z, where Z is this. Well, this Z is actually the distance from R to the top. The vertical distance. What? The vertical distance from R to the top. Uh -huh. Why didn't you bring in copies for everybody? Oh, okay. Z is. Okay. Same. Same kind of idea, just a different origin. So Z goes that way. All right, and you need to you need to make sure that at every place the Normal stress is constant. Now the the area there will also be, of course, a function of z, uh, but that will go with r. And so uh, you need to figure out something about the the total volume, which will then also be a function of z, but all three of those functions, they're not independent of each other, they're all related because whatever the radius is determines what the area is, whatever the area is determines what the volume is, and uh, etc. Uh, such that the normal stress at any point is constant. Right, that's how you read it? Yeah. Okay, so to start that one, um, start from here and go down um, some distance z, uh, which will give you, uh, th then you can start building these functions and then uh, Integrated, you know the you know the entire height. The height is set as something or other. Yeah, it probably doesn't matter. Probably did because because even if it's this tall or this tall, it's all going to be the same. Thing. So the only thing you're starting with is you have a, a set radius up there of R1, so it'll probably be a function of that as well. And uh, this load here. That load that's over that area, of course, will be um, a function of the density times that volume times, and actually this will be a function of Z, so we'll put that in there. So this is a function of Z as well times g. This is mass times gravity. So it's it's just the entire weight that's above it. So Doobie's thinking, boy, I'm glad I got the other edition. I did 70 in my book. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. 
which I'll let you get away with this one. No, but I'm saying I did the one on your news. Your news schedule says number 70. That's number 70. Number 70 in my book is totally different. The, the old book no longer has a 70. The new book has a 70. In the old book, that problem should have another, a different number, 77, I think. For the, for the most part, all the way down those two columns, it's, it's one for one, but there's a couple later where the author actually switched the order so that the, the three are the same, but maybe not the three in the same order. So I figured it would be better to put it in numerical order than switch it. Okay, help you a little bit? Yeah. Think you can work on something? Sure. Okay. Thanks. And I'll, uh, I'll post those, uh, I'll post the solutions. Well, gee whiz, for this first, now I have to think of make sure what solutions I have that I can post for this first week. Um, I may just, I can't remember how the author gave me the solutions. Or maybe I'll just put up the entire chapter and you can find your problem, whichever one it was you did. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll be all straightened out for next week. Hopefully. All right. Any other questions before we get going? All right. Um, we've looked at uh, only three things so far, I guess. So let's get them up there. And I want to talk about one of the problems in particular. Uh, whether you did it or not, it's still a great problem in terms of some of the things we've got that we've been working on. So we've, we've looked so far at the normal stress. Sometimes with a little script end down there just to, to reappear imply that that's the normal stress. And that's the force on any particular cross-sectional area. Such that the force and that area are perpendicular. So Keep that in mind. It's 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 relatively straightforward so far. Um, starting to uh, I think tomorrow. I think it's on the schedule for tomorrow. We'll look at the possibility that the cross-sectional area we're interested in is not perpendicular to the axial length of the piece. We're gonna because we need to look at at all the stresses in a material, not just the very simplest of all stresses. Remember that this area we're looking at here is an imaginary cut through the uh, integral piece. We have not actually exposed this area. However, the force does still go through that area as the piece supports these loads. So we're going to make imaginary cuts uh, starting tomorrow that are not necessarily themselves perpendicular to the axial length of the piece, nor to the immediate uh, direction of the force itself. So we'll start with that uh, tomorrow. That way we can look at all of the possibilities, uh, protect against all the possible failure modes as we look through these pieces. Um, what came next? Shear stress. Shear stress. This is also just a force uh, on an area that uh, needs to support it. This one a little bit different in that now we're looking at the force that's parallel to the area that's supporting it. Um, the pieces, the, the, uh, the structural members and all of these things we're talking about need to be able to prevent failure in either one of the modes. Now remember, by failure, um, normally you think we're talking about the actual destruction of the, the member itself and complete loss of the structure. But 
as we'll uh, as we'll see shortly here, we're also talking about not just catastrophic failure. We're also going to be talking about deformation. It could be that under these forces, the members, the structural members, deform just enough that whatever the structure is can no longer serve its purpose adequately. Could be that that things get out of alignment just enough that uh, things don't work right anymore. We could have a uh, you know some kind of motor stand that needs to hold up this great diesel engine, but if if the stand deforms enough, then the diesel engine is no longer in line with the uh, drive axle and no longer uh, adequately uh, supplies power to wherever it's supposed to go. That can be considered a failure, even though nothing is broken. It just may mean a very expensive adjustment needs to be made. Either way, in, in terms of what we're looking at, that's considered an engineering failure. Then we had the bearing stress we looked at as well. Maybe put a little B on it like that. Uh, very much the same as the others. In fact, really doesn't look any different um, than did the normal stress. The idea here being that uh, we, we are really looking at perhaps a, a major area, maybe a section of floor or um, some, some part of the support, and it's, it's not the, uh, it's not the failure of the member itself, it's more what we're concerned with is that the support structure could deform. Maybe this, uh, this great diesel engine stand we have, the stand is perfectly fine. The engineers who designed it put it together and it works just like it's supposed to work. But when it's installed, it's installed on a floor that uh, perhaps the floor itself depressed enough that now everything's out of alignment even though the stand worked perfectly, it's that the floor itself was, was uh, damaged in some way, maybe just some simple depression around the leg, and now things are just enough out of line that things don't work quite right. And again, maybe it's a very expensive fix to come in, shore up the base a little bit, maybe just lift everything, slip a plate under there that sort of spreads out the weight a little bit, uh, everybody's seen those type of things where, where you see uh, the leg of some piece of furniture. In fact, you, you may have exactly this at home. Uh, look at some of the heavier pieces of furniture and underneath it is a little, uh, a little furniture pad. That just helps spread out that way. All that's doing is increasing this area. The fourth force is set because that's the weight of the piece. If we can increase this area, we can decrease the bearing stress, and then there's perhaps less damage to the uh, to the floor. If you have wood floors, um, you don't want a heavy piece of furniture sitting on a very small area causing a very large bearing stress. So those are the three things we've looked at so far. What we'll start with this week is not just what these values are but what the material can do in response to some of these loads that we've got. We're going to start looking at the actual deformation of pieces under these loads. The fact that if we're compressing a piece, it will physically shorten somewhat, and we need to take that into account. If we tension a piece, it, could, it will physically lengthen, and we need to account for that. These pieces can actually bend, uh, deform uh, laterally, and we'll start taking that into account then as we go through uh, the rest of the week. In fact, much of the rest of the semester. Is that where we are now? Sounds, sounds like uh, three old friends coming to visit. Three, three old college buddies came for a visit. You 
you look around the room and think how dear these people are, what they'll mean to you in the 20th reunion we all go to. I'll be in my wheelchair. Bobby. Are you pushing it around? <laughs> yeah. To the top of the stairs. <laughs> all right. Uh, one of the problems that was assigned, um, oh, I don't remember which book it was, number 97, doesn't matter if you did it or not. It's a really good problem. We'll talk about it now, uh, right now, as part of what we're doing. It's a problem where there are three discs that are supporting a load. So the top one was just a simple solid disc of radius, uh, sorry, of diameter D1. And this was labeled disc A. Then below it, was another wider thicker disc of radius uh, D2. Sorry, diameter D2. Now, that disc is perfectly over the edges of the uh, material below it. Has a, there's, a, there's a hole in the material below it. Actually, you know what? I'm going to abandon this drawing. <laughs> I can do that because I do. I write in chalk. We'll just take the side view like in the book. All right, there's the one that's D1. That's labeled A. Below it is a disc diameter D2. That's the one that's perfectly aligned with the edges of the support material below. And then in between those is a washer-like disc. that has, has a hole in it So that's what we need to look at on this problem. 
So we're asked for a couple things. Find the minimum D1 of the top disk. If it's too small, the bearing stress on disk B will be too great. We also need to find the diameter D2 The concern being there, um, the shear failure of PC. And we also need to find, find D3. The, the concern there, uh, at least part of that being uh, the bearing stress uh, being felt by part C. What you're not to consider, and it may not have been clear in this one, is we don't need to consider the possible failure of the support material itself. It, it looks in this problem like that might be the concern, um, but if you read it carefully and look at what it's asked for, that's not what you're looking for. We're considering that this support material is, uh, is its integrity is inviolable and will be everything will be fine. So a couple things you're given. Given an allowable bearing stress. of 350 megapascals. Also, an allowable shear stress of 125 megapascals. The implication being, though it's not a direct concern, uh, that maybe these three discs are all of this very same material.
we're concerned with the possibility that since B and this hole are lined up that we actually have shear failure through PC right there at those, uh, that, that little blue interface. That uh, sort of an interior plug of C is actually pushed through the hole. these problems, the thing you're concerned, the, the, the trickiest part of it is making sure you get the right area in these. The load, of course, is pretty straightforward. The allowable stress has got to be greater than equal to the actual stress that we're finding.
which has a has a diameter D2 and a thickness 10 millimeters. So the area that's doing the supporting is this area right there. That's what's going to shear through. If C fails in shear, what you're going to be left with is the, the, the big washer. You know, the, the, if C fails in shear, and bless you, it fails in shear, you're going to have this washer of diameter. Well, we don't know what diameter it is because that's not, that's not the concern. But you'd have this hole ripped out here as this entire part B through drops th drops through that washer seat. Dramatic drawing, isn't it? That one is kind of scary looking. Cool, and there it goes right through. So it's this area that needs to do the support uh, against shear failure in disc C. That's why you need the thickness. So you use the circumference five times thickness? The circumference of the circle, then times that six thickness. So it's uh, pi d2 squared over four times the thickness of, of C, which is the given 10 millimeters. Oh yeah, circumference, sorry. That was the area. So 2 pi r or pi d. Man, you don't have to snap away just when there's a little mistake. Yeah, well, that's coming out first thing. <laughs> Not so stupid as to broadcast my mistakes. want to uh, 
you know, our, our, we're right at the limit with that um, value you just came up with. Was it 0.365 or 0.0365? 0 0.0365. 0.0365 meters. That puts us right at the shear failure limit. So would we want to go a little bit smaller than that? Or a little bit greater than that? If we go smaller than that, then this area that's supporting the load against shear decreases. So we want to go greater than that. Uh, to make sure that we're all right. All right, so that was the first one. We got that. seven meters, give or take. Now that we've got that, we could possibly work on... Uh, this uh, area D3 so that we have enough area now supporting, uh, uh, preventing um, assume now uh, bearing failure, bearing stress failure in disk C. We now know how much of the load is coming from B now that we've sized it, but we need to make sure that the hole is not so big that there's not enough of the disk C there to support it. So we've got disk C with a small hole in the center of it. And B now bears on that surface and if that hole, that interior hole D3 is too big or too small, we could have bearing failure. It's what? If it's too big, then this bearing surface is too small and we could have bearing failure at disk C. Now remember, that's not necessarily a, cat, a, a, a failure where the thing is destroyed. It could be just enough for everything to be out of alignment and then nothing works after that. So now we're looking at a possible bearing failure at C, where again we have to uh, set the area so that we've got uh, at least a minimum of the area available for support of this piece.
single time? Did you do this one already? And you were looking at all the same areas we've been looking at? Okay. Yeah. Probably my favorite student. And that is on camera. Of course, the camera doesn't know who. Any one of you get your girlfriends to watch and say, oh, see, he's talking about me right here.
Okay. So we've, we've got this whole area here, and we've taken out this area here because that's not offering any support. We don't have to worry about the 10 millimeters. Not in this case, because remember what we're talking about is the entire weight sitting on this surface. We've already taken care of the fact that we've got enough thickness to prevent uh, C from shearing through. Now we're looking at the bearing, the possibility of bearing failure on C. What do you get? Looks good. You guys agree? Something like 27.5 millimeters in. When we had what? Watch your units a lot here. They're going to be going between meters and millimeters a lot. All right, then you figure out. The last little pit, little bit, uh, we need to have a big enough diameter on disc A to make sure that uh, we don't have bearing failure there as well. So again, now we're looking at that area there to make sure that we don't have bearing failure in disc B from the load on disc A. smaller than D2, but any relationship between D1 and the D3 we just found. could be bigger than D3. It depends entirely upon the ability of disc B 
to withstand this bearing stress. It has nothing to do with either D3 or the thickness of B. All we're looking at is this, this bearing stress and whether D1 is big enough. Was there any reason they gave that to us? What? The thickness of B. Well, we'll see in a second. Let's make sure if it's got a D1 of some kind. You guys agree? Did you check your numbers? It's too far away.
want to make sure that the area is uh, big enough that we don't have shear, shear failure in that part B. So we've got to be really careful, careful with what areas we use in these problems. Do we need the thickness of B? Yep. And that's oh, given. Oh. That's oh. given. That's 20 millimeters. that in and we're set. 